the coup was widely condemned. And there was widespread allegations that the United States had, had clearly been involved. Ironically, the week that the coup took place, Henry Kissinger was being confirmed as Secretary of State. In the first day of his hearings, he was asked about Chile, and he said, look, we are neutral on this coup. Even on the very day that he was testifying to that, this secret cable was going from his office down to the U.S. Embassy in, in Chile. And it said, we welcome General Pinochet. Uh, we want him to know that we desire to cooperate in any way possible. That's Peter Kornbluh, and this is Alternative Radio. I'm David Barsamyan. This edition of AR features Peter Kornbluh on Kissinger and the coup in Chile. The 1973 U.S.-directed coup overthrowing the democratically elected government of Salvador Allende in Chile is one of the pivotal moments in 20th century Latin American history. The coup was ordered by Richard Nixon and implemented by Nobel Peace Prize winner Henry Kissinger. After Allende's election in 1970, Kissinger infamously demonstrated his dedication to democracy when he said, I don't see why we need to stand by and watch a country go communist due to the irresponsibility of its own people. The coup brought to power General Augusto Pinochet, who immediately launched a reign of terror. Kissinger has never been held to account for what he did in Chile. Peter Kornblu is senior analyst at the National Security Archive in Washington, D.C. He's the author of Bay of Pigs Declassified, the secret CIA report, and the Pinochet file. He spoke at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. Note that his remarks were made while General Pinochet was still alive. It was just not that long ago that Chile commemorated the 30th anniversary of this coup that took place on, of all dates, 9-11. 9-11-1973 was Chile's day of, of, of reckoning. And when the 30th anniversary came about uh, in 2003, I was coming out with this book called The Pinochet File, and Kissinger, Henry Kissinger's lawyer, uh, Bill Rogers, a, a guy who had been his deputy assistant secretary uh, of state in the mid-1970s and has for many years since been his, his lawyer, Bill Rogers said he would debate me uh, in Washington over these key, these key points. And so we got ready for debate, and because he was going to debate me, he got to get an advanced copy of my book and knew what was going to be in it. And at that point, he and Henry Kissinger invited a very conservative writer, a Latin Americanist named Mark Falkoff, who some of you who work on Latin America may have, have read over the years. He invited – Kissinger and Bill Rogers invited Mark Falkoff to come to New York City and – at Kissinger's office, go through a still secret stash of documents known as the Kissinger Telcons. Telcon is short for telephone conversations. It's like Memcon, which is bureaucraties for memorandum of conversation, but this is Telcon, which is a transcript of uh, telephone conversations. And what people uh, may not know is that is that. Uh, Perhaps getting the idea from his boss, Richard Nixon, uh, Henry Kissinger secretly taped all of his telephone conversations. For historians, it's, it's quite interesting when you have Kissinger on the phone talking to Nixon, because Nixon was secretly taping all of his phone conversations. Uh, and in many cases, we now have a, a, a Nixon tape, uh, an audio tape of him talking to Henry Kissinger. And on Kissinger's side, we have a transcript of the same conversation. And those of us who have little else to do in Washington like to spend our days comparing uh, these two things to see if they, if they match. In any event, to make a long story short, the point was to bring Falkoff to, to New York to show him these documents that nobody else had actually seen and to, to have him then write this piece in Commentary Magazine on the myths that won't die, the myth that Kissinger was heavily involved in Chile, the myth that the Nixon administration cared enough about Chile to actually try and undermine and overthrow Salvador Allende. 
And they let him sift through these telephone conversations, and over a, a period that they covered, they covered many, many years, but over from the 1970 to 1973 period, he only found four conversations that, Nixon, that Kissinger had that related to Chile. And he therefore went ahead and wrote this piece in Commentary magazine based on this, the fact that he only found four documents, essentially arguing that Kissinger was occupied with other things uh, and that the United States really wasn't involved in Chile. We hadn't really tried to, to stop Allende, um, and we weren't responsible in any way, shape, or form for the coup in 1973. And in fact, Falkoff took a telcon of a conversation between Nixon and Kissinger five days after the coup uh, on September 16th, 1973. And he quoted it in, in, in this article. He has Nixon saying to Kissinger on the phone, um, he, said, he says, as for Nixon, he was evidently pleased. How could he not be? But exhibited no sense of complicity with the coup makers themselves. As he said on the phone to Kissinger on September 16th, quote, well, we didn't, as you know, our hand doesn't show in this one, does it? <laughs> to which Kissinger replied, quote, we didn't do it, period, end of quote, end of paragraph, end of section, end of argument. Well, my organization, the National Security Archive, managed to get the entire 30,000 pages of telcons declassified about nine months after this article came out. And the first thing I did on the day that they were declassified is I went to the box that had September of 73, all the telephone conversations from September 73, and I looked for this conversation that was quoted. And I, I want to share it with you. It turns out that Mark Falkoff, either with the complicity of Kissinger and Rogers or on his own, it's not clear which, didn't fully quote what was said. The actual answer is, we didn't do it. I mean, we helped them. Blank, which has been deleted for some type of security reason, created the conditions as great as possible. This, of course, changes the entire thrust of Kissinger's answer and shows that this effort in Commentary Magazine to present this a certain way was totally distorted, mendacious, historically inaccurate, you name it. This is what the conversation really was. I'd been pushing the um, Nixon Library to give me what I thought was the corresponding tape of this conversation. But they reminded me just recently that the scandal of the Nixon tapes, the scandal of Watergate, and the fact that the tapes exi existed broke in July of 73, and at that point, Nixon stopped taping his conversations. So I will never actually have the audio version of, of, of this particular conversation. But we still have this, and it's an extremely important document. And when we did get the document, we put this up on our website, and it made headlines around, around the world. This is obviously a controversy. And it, what's interesting about it is it is a controversy that Henry Kissinger cares deeply about. He has gone to tremendous lengths. And you can go on the web, and you can see the whole controversy at Foreign Affairs Magazine, at the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, the whole issue there that developed after my book was reviewed, Kissinger making phone calls to the highest levels of the council protesting, the reviewer eventually quitting because the council would not let him respond to the letters that, that Kissinger and, and, and Rogers put together. It is a controversy that continues, and it really gets down to a, an essential fact. Chile, of all the historical issues that Kissinger was involved in, haunts him more than anything, and haunts his career uh, as a statesman more than any other controversy. And that includes even Cambodia and Vietnam, which are salient issues that he has been criticized about, that movies have been made about. But the, but the one that persists, in part because it is an issue uh, about which we continue to learn about, we continue to get declassified documents about, is this, this case of, of Chile. It has haunted him historically. It has haunted him in the courts as well. And this is the question that I get asked the most when I, when I speak to colleges around, around the, the, this country and even in, in, in other countries. 
when will Henry Kissinger be prosecuted for crimes against humanity? I tend to, to respond that uh, it's very difficult to prosecute a former U.S. official, but what we really look at is whether he is prosecuted, in a sense, in the court of public opinion, whether in terms of the historical evidence that there is, there can be essentially a, a trial of history, as it were. What is the case against Henry Kissinger? And really, we're talking about two cases. We're talking about the court of history, and we're talking about courts of law. And I want to spend the bulk of my time on the first uh, issue, the first case, the court of history, but I will finish by bringing you up to date on the second set of cases, those that uh, have gone to court where Kissinger has faced the issue of, of, of having civil suits filed against him for actions relating to his Chile policy. Let me just summarize the historical case for you. Henry Kissinger was the key policymaker. He was the policymaker of continuity in the Chilean case, in the case of Chile, in the case of Chile from 70 to 73, when Salvador Allende, a socialist, was freely elected and the United States decided to work against him, to work to undermine his government, and then welcomed a coup against him. And Kissinger was the policymaker, the decision maker of continuity in the first three years of Augusto Pinochet's military regime, uh, a, uh, a regime that gained renown around the world for, for its uh, atrocities, for its uh, acts of torture, for its acts of disappearances, for its acts of international terrorism, um, including blowing up a car in downtown Washington, D.C. in September of 1976, killing uh, Allende's former ambassador to Washington and a colleague of his at the Institute for Policy Studies, Ronnie Moffat, as was Orlando Letelier, the famous letelier Moffat assassination. Kissinger was the, the, the person who, who designed the policy to embrace the Pinochet regime, to help it consolidate, um, to continue to aid it through, through covert support, through economic support, even military uh, arms sales, um, during its kind of period of, of consolidation, 19, September of 1973 through, um, through 1976, and right up to the day when Kissinger left office in January of 1977. During that time, he not only designed the policy of embracing Pinochet, but he actually warded off growing protests from his own staff to distance the United States from the Chilean military regime because of its human rights violations. Let's just talk about the first period of time, 70 to 73. This is what Kissinger testified to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in September of 1974. This was the, the line, this was the argument that he and Nixon made after it was revealed by Seymour Hersh, the same Seymour Hersh that has been revealing the Abu Ghraib scandals and the uh, ongoing covert operations and the Pentagon's new plans now to bomb Iran, etc. He came to fame, uh, well, many years ago, breaking a similar atrocity in the Vietnam War, the My Lai Massacre. Um, but for my generation, he was known for breaking the story of CIA covert intervention against Allende. And after that story broke, Kissinger testified for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and, and this is what he said uh, about what U.S. policy was. Not a single element of this statement, and you can break it down into three or four parts, is actually true. What is true is that the State Department wanted to work towards the elections in 1976 and live with Allende until that time uh, and work with institutions in Chile and not engage in covert efforts to overthrow Allende. But it is also true that Kissinger, as national security advisor to Richard Nixon, overruled uh, this position uh, and this argument, and we're going to we're going to talk about that. Um, Kissinger's argument was that uh, was that uh, we had to act aggressively uh, against uh, against Allende. He was involved in the very earliest efforts uh, of decision making to 
promote a coup against Allende. And this started even before Allende was elected. Henry Kissinger started to chair what was known as the 40 Committee meetings, meetings. The 40 Committee was the top secret unit in the U.S. government that deliberated and made decisions about covert operations abroad. And Chile was very much on their agenda in the summer of 1970. Polls showed that Allende might conceivably eke out a small victory uh, in, in Chile. Um, it was a three-way race. He wasn't going to get a majority. On the other hand, the embassy in Santiago thought that perhaps the Christian Democrats would win. Um, in August, Henry Kissinger asked for contingency plans for what to do about Allende if he managed to win on September 4th, 1970. And just a few weeks before the election, a cable went down to the ambassador saying we need a cold-blooded assessment. If Allende wins, could there be a coup? And after the election, uh, between September 4th and September 9th, it was clear that the message went to the CIA from Kissinger's office that they had to start to plan to work with the Chilean military towards some type of action that would prevent Allende from being inaugurated on November 4th. We talk about Chile, and we should talk about it using the current terminology. This was one of the original clear examples of a preemptive strike. Allende had been elected on September 4th. He wasn't due to be inaugurated president until November uh, 3rd or 4th almost eight weeks later. And here in that period of, that interim period of time, the United States tried to block his, his inauguration by promoting a coup. The guy hadn't even been able to make a single pronouncement or order a single action against the United States of America as president of, of Chile. Even before he became president, Nixon and Kissinger arrived at the decision uh, to, to try and, and, and block him. On September 15th, Nixon and Kissinger and, of all people, the Attorney General of the United States, John Mitchell, had a 15-minute meeting in the Oval Office during which Nixon gave the order to the CIA, to Richard Helms, the director of the CIA, to go into Chile, quote, make the economy scream, use the best men we have, $10 $10 million more if necessary, according to Helms's notes. And the very last passage was 48 hours to come up with a plan of action. And that plan of action was to be given to Dr. Kissinger, who was essentially going to coordinate and oversee this effort. That operation to promote a military coup in the fall of 1973 and block Allende's uh, inauguration was codenamed Operation F.U. Belt. Operation F.U. Belt uh, was an effort to, to spur the Chilean military to action uh, in a six-week period of time, to make the economy scream, to create rumors, to get U.S. companies to pull out, to plant propaganda, to pay disgruntled retired generals uh, and f- siphon, funnel over $50,000 to, to thugs to carry out uh, violence. The main problem with making this work was that the commander-in-chief of the Chilean Armed Forces, a general named Rene Schneider, uh, was a constitutionalist. He said Allende was uh, elected uh, on September 4th. The country is at peace. There's no real agitation against him. We have a long constitutionalist history. In fact, in Chile, we have the longest constitutionalist history of any Latin American nation. Um, The Socialist Party and the Communist Party have been around for a long, long time. Uh, you know, essentially his position was, what is the big problem here? Uh, and he said, and he stood in the way of these coup plotters because the troops all answered to him. So what was the issue to do with him? To make him disappear, to, quote, neutralize him. Uh, and that was the plan that the CIA came up with, with disgruntled generals. It didn't work. We're going to talk a little bit more about this plan in a second. Instead of kidnapping him, which was the original idea, he was uh, shot and killed on the 22nd of October, 1970. Instead of the country kind of getting into an uproar about this and blaming Allende, of course, they rallied around Allende. He was ratified by the Chilean Congress and inaugurated on the uh, 3rd of, of, of November. On the 3rd of November, U.S. policy passes into a different phase of dealing with, with Allende. 
And it's here where Kissinger is going to argue that the decision was made to live and let live. We would support democratic institutions, but we would focus on 1976, six years down the road, uh, and, um, and hope to defeat Allende through the same process that he was elected, a democratic vote. In truth, what happened was that a, a National Security Council meeting was held within 48 hours of Salvador Allende's inauguration, where Nixon and Kissinger and the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State and the CIA director all discussed, quote, how to bring Allende down. It has taken 30 years to get this document, which is the briefing paper, the first page of a 12-page briefing paper that Henry Kissinger prepared for Richard Nixon for this National Security Council meeting. And we now know that Kissinger actually asked for this meeting to be postponed for one day from the 5th of November to the 6th of November so he would have time to go and sit with Nixon and explain to him why it was so important that Nixon reject the State Department's argument that we could have a modus vivendi with Allende. The State Department's position was that Allende at worst could be a Latin American Tito. Uh, who was the kind of somewhat neutralist uh, leader of, of uh, Yugoslavia in, in those days, which was kind of a buffer state between the Soviet bloc uh, and, the, and, 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 and the West, but certainly more radical than, than the West. Um, and that was the State Department's position. The guy's going to be a Latin American Tito. What's the worst thing that can happen with that? Far worse, the argument was, that we try and covertly undermine him and we get caught and all of Latin America sees that we have just paid lip service to democracy. All the world sees that we don't respect the legitimate decision, the democratic vote of another country. We violate the, our, the, the UN Charter, which we have signed, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that was their argument. And what Kissinger does in this meeting is he tells Nixon, first he tells him this kind of hyperbolic uh, language at the very top of this document, that this is going to be the biggest decision he's, he's made, that the whole world could change given this decision. And towards the end of the document, he says to him, you have to break with customs at this meeting, where usually you just take everybody's argument under advisement. You have to say, no, I'm rejecting the State Department's advice, and we are going to be as aggressive as we can be to bring uh, Allende down. And that is what happened at the meeting the very next day. Those of you who are studying regime change, who want to know how the United States goes about uh, attempting to covertly overthrow another government, will be interested in this document, which Kissinger wrote for Nixon uh, about, let's see, two weeks um, after that National Security Council meeting. By then, he had met frequently with the CIA. They'd come up with a, with a plan, an overall plan, for kind of a five-part process of destabilizing Chile. Um, and you can see there um, what that breaks down to. This is, this is your typical short briefing paper for the President of the United States. Behind this paper are, are hundreds and hundreds of pages of CIA documents and State Department memos and, you know, Treasury Department uh, meetings and, 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 and everything to, to, com to come up with this. Um, under the blacked out part, but we've been able to figure out what's hidden under there, and it's basically a reference to um, planting articles in, in newspapers and other press around the world, and then making sure that the, that propaganda kind of blows back into Chile, gets reprinted, gets reprinted there um, to, make, to make Allende look bad. And this is essentially what the United States did over the next three years. Um, we cut off... Uh, Credits. We secretly pressured the multilateral banks not to lend any money to Allende. We have one declassified memo where Kissinger's deputy, Alexander Haig, writes to him, you know, the guy who's head of the, of the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, is, you know, kind of uncooperative. Let's work towards getting him forced out of his position as president and move another candidate who's more malleable uh, into that position so that we can implement our policy on cutting off funds to Chile. We cut off bilateral credits to Chile. We sent our representatives to Paris 
uh, and uh, worked very hard to get other countries to uh, reject Chile's petition to renegotiate their, their external debt. Um, we escalated training programs for Chilean military officers at the School of the Americas and started to work very closely with uh, generals and colonels and captains inside the Chilean military um, to identify which ones would be most likely to carry out a coup. And most importantly, we funneled money into the leading newspaper, El Mercurio, M-E-R-C-U-R-I-O, El Mercurio, to keep it alive, uh, to keep it financially solvent uh, when it started to have um, some, some real problems uh, with staying afloat, not because it represented the democratic institution of the press, but because it was the leading bullhorn, particularly starting in 1972, calling for military action against the elected government. After the coup took place, the CIA wrote a memo requesting continuing money to support El Mercurio and the other propaganda operations in Chile. And it said, point blank, in this memo, that the propaganda project, the funneling of money to El Mercurio, some of which was personally approved by Kissinger, and some of which, the majority of which, and this is one of the most amazing facts that came out of these declassified documents, a million dollars of this money that was funneled down Mercurio was personally approved by the President of the United States. I think it's perhaps one of the few times when can, you can actually pinpoint that the President of the United States was signing off on a covert CIA propaganda operation, because usually presidents authorize general covert operations, but they don't micromanage, they don't get involved in the minutia of specific projects that the CIA is undertaking. But this one went up to Nixon, he authorized a million, and a few months later, Kissinger authorized another 300,000. Funds that don't seem like a lot in this day and age, but in that time was quite, quite significant. But as you note in this, in this memo, if you read it carefully, you'll see that the CIA takes credit for this project setting the stage for the coup in Chile. And really what the CIA is saying here is what Kissinger then, by this time, has told Nixon. We helped them. We created the conditions as great as possible. You're listening to Peter Kornblu on Kissinger and the coup in Chile. This is AR. You can order copies of this program by calling our toll-free number, 1-800-444-1977. That's one 800 444 1977 or you can order online on our website alternativeradio.org that's alternativeradio.org General Pinochet took power on September 11th 1973 there was widespread outrage around the world Allende's kind of socialist constitutionalist experiment in Chile had really kind of captured the hearts of, of students, of governments, of citizens, uh, almost everywhere, particularly in, in, in this country as well, but throughout Europe. And the coup was widely condemned, and there was widespread allegations that the United States had, had clearly been involved. Ironically, the week that the coup took place, Henry Kissinger was being confirmed as Secretary of State uh, and his confirmation hearings were, I believe, on the 13th, 14th, 15th of September. In the first day of his hearings, he was asked about Chile, and he said, look, we are neutral on this coup. We learned in 1964 from the Brazilian example that we should not run out and uh, recognize a new military government. So we are neutral on this coup. Even on the very day that he was testifying to that, this secret cable was going from his office down to the U.S. Embassy in, in Chile. And it said, we welcome General Pinochet. Uh, we want him to know that we desire to cooperate in any way possible. For the moment, since there is such widespread international condemnation on the coup and all these allegations of U.S. involvement, we believe that it would be better if our contacts with him and if our well wishes for his assuming power remain confidential, uh, and uh, we want him to understand that we are going to wait to officially recognize him for another few weeks until the dust has settled. And that, that is what happened. We have 
most recently obtained the declassified cable traffic that was coming in from the CIA and other places on the atrocities that were taking place. The human rights issue started virtually uh, day one. I think I have a, a CIA intelligence cable that was dated about 10 days after the coup on September 21st, which quoted a source as saying that 10,000 people had been killed in the first several days after the coup. Now, this turned out to be a wild exaggeration, although about 1,500 people were actually killed in the first three weeks uh, after the coup. But this was the type of intelligence that was coming in. And even the New York Times and Newsweek were reporting massive atrocities. But we've obtained the declassification of Kissinger's first staff meeting as Secretary of State, which took place um, on October 1st, 1973. And then when he gets to the, the meeting, gets to, the, on, to Latin America, because the way he would do these meetings is they have kind of regional reports. First, the Africa desk would report, and then the European desk would report, and then the Asia desk, and then the Latin America desk. When he gets to Latin America, his assistant secretary for Latin America, a guy named Jack Kubish, comes in and says, you know, I've just come from Congress, and, and, and they're asking me about these reports in Newsweek and the New York Times that, that thousands of people have been killed, that the morgues are stacked to the ceiling with, with, with bodies. What should I say to them? What should I say to these congressmen and to the press that are, that are, that are demanding answers? And Kissinger is very specific in this meeting. He says, I want you to understand something. This government, no matter how badly it behaves, is better for our interests than Allende was. And that was the operative line that the State Department and the U.S. government carried for the first three years, even as atrocities began to, to escalate. Those of you who are interested in, in human rights will be very interested in studying the case of Chile because the human rights movement as we know it today and the legislation that is on the books of our government making human rights a component of U.S. foreign policy, legislation that frankly hasn't been very effective but didn't even exist and wasn't part of the debate over U.S. foreign policy before the coup in Chile, all resulted from Kissinger's position the largesse, the embrace, the political support, uh, economic and military support that he gave to Pinochet between 1973 and 1976. Over a period of time, the American public and the U.S. Congress, which was quite radicalized in the mid-1970s by the Vietnam War, by the Watergate scandal, and by the scandals over Chile, stepped up and said, human rights has to be a part of U.S. foreign policy, we can't allow Dr. Kissinger and his kind of his uh, sensibility of, of realpolitik to support whoever, because that happens to be in the interest of the United States, we can't allow him to continue with this. We need the U.S. government to understand that it is a national interest of the United States to promote human rights and promote uh, democracy. And what you see in the declassified records is, is slowly but surely almost his entire staff from people in the embassy, to State Department officials, uh, to his own deputy at that time, William Rogers, uh, who became Assistant Secretary in, the, in 1974, coming to him and saying, you have to recognize that there's a human rights issue here. We need to stop aid to, to, to Pinochet. Ted Kennedy is going to lead the Senate and Tom Harkin, who was a congressman at the time, is going to lead the House and they're going to pass laws that prevent you from giving economic and military aid uh, to Augusto Pinochet, and we're going to have to work with these forces. And what you see in these declassified records, these transcripts of these, uh, of these meetings, is Kissinger railing uh, against this, tooth and nail, and making basically three arguments. One, that Pinochet was no worse than Allende in terms of his human rights record, and that the reason these damn liberals in Congress are angry about this is because, uh, is because Pinochet is pro-American, and they can't stand it, you know. They can't stand it that a, that a pro-American uh, military regime overthrew an uh, anti-American uh, government. That was his first argument from, from these transcripts. The second one was a very, very interesting one. He argued repeatedly 
that any human rights pressure that was brought to bear against Pinochet would weaken the military regime and would eventually end up in the left regaining power in Chile. Now, he was quite clear that he wanted to keep this regime strong and that even diplomatic pressures were not something he supported uh, and that he did not want to see happen. And then the final argument he made, and I think you can all understand this, is that he felt that if the Congress got away with restricting his latitude in supporting the Pinochet regime, it would start to take away his, his, his foreign policy privileges in supporting many, many other right-wing uh, regimes that violated human rights. In those days, South Korea, Taiwan, South Africa, uh, and, and quite a few others. And this was the argument that he made. In fact, when you see these transcripts, and I brought the most incredible one to show you, you see that he spent more time disparaging his own staff for caring about human rights than he spent actually condemning Chilean officials, Pinochet's officials, for violating them. And a rather extraordinary meeting took place in September of 1975 with Kissin when Kissinger met with Pinochet's foreign minister, a general named Patricio Carvajal, who came to Washington uh, to talk to Kissinger. This was an incredibly difficult time for Chileans. Uh, the human rights abuses in Chile had escalated dramatically, and dozens of people were being disappeared, which was a phenomenon that was not widely known in Latin America until Chile started doing it um, in the summer of 1975. Disappeared. People taken out of their apartments in unmarked cars, taken to secret detention camps, tortured, eventually killed. Um, it's starting to sound a little familiar, I hate to say, but, um, but and, and disappeared. We now know because of Chilean investigations that either their bodies were buried uh, or they, was a, they had a whole operation that Chileans called Operation Puerto Montt where they took um, human rights victims, um, flew them to the coast, tied metal girders around their bodies and put them in, in burlap sacks and in a helicopter, a special helicopter, dropped them into the, uh, the ocean. All of this was happening in the summer of 1975. And in preparation for this meeting, Kissinger's staff had listed all of these abuses and urged him to talk to Chile's foreign minister about these atrocities. And I just want to show you a document which, you know, I've spent a lot of time working on Henry Kissinger, and I've read a lot of things that he said. And, and this is a statement that, that every time I show it to a group like you continues to sh shock me. And I, and I am at a point that I really should not be shocked. Look at the very first thing that Kissinger says to Pinochet's foreign minister, literally the very first thing he says to him when the meeting starts. Yes, the foreign minister comes in. He says, I want to thank you for giving us this opportunity to talk to you. And Kissinger's first statement is, well, I read the briefing paper for this meeting, and it was nothing but human rights. The State Department is made up of people who have a vocation for the ministry. Because there were not enough churches for them, they went into the Department of State. Now, there was one more opportunity before the end of the, of the, of the Ford, uh, Kissinger, Nixon, Ford era for Kissinger to make a, a statement on, on, on human rights. Um, he met privately with Augusto Pinochet on June 8, 1976. He actually had been convinced by his deputy, Bill Rogers, that in order to be able to tell Congress that the State Department cared about human rights, Kissinger should go to the Organization of American States Conference in San, that was being held in Santiago, Chile. And Kissinger would go there too, and he would, by God, make a speech about human rights in Latin America in general. Before he made the speech, he met privately with Augusto Pinochet. And the embassy had pushed for him to meet with Pinochet, and his own deputy, Bill Rogers, had sent him a set of briefing papers saying, you have to be very clear about the message that Pinochet needs to clean up his act, improve his human rights record. Um, Chile has become kind of a symbol like Spain during the 1940s. It's, you know, it's become somewhat like Franco Spain, and we are so associated with Chile that we need to make this statement, and you are the only one that Pinochet will listen to. 
As I mentioned to you earlier, I debated Kissinger's deputy, Bill Rogers, in September of 2003. And during that debate, Bill Rogers, who was at the meeting with Pinochet and Kissinger, told the audience, I was at that meeting when Kissinger met with Pinochet, and believe me, Pinochet got the message. Well, I stood up at that debate as I stand before you now, and I said, you know, we have Bill Rogers to thank for the fact that we have a transcript of what message Pinochet got, because Bill Rogers was at that meeting, he took shorthand notes of what was said and went back to the State Department and transcribed the entire conversation. It is an incredibly important historical document. Uh, It took more than 25 years to get it declassified, but we finally have it. What you see when you actually read the transcript is not that Kissinger went in and told Pinochet, you really have to clean up your act. What he went in and said is, I'm forced to give a speech in a few hours about human rights. And in the speech, there's going to be a couple of paragraphs about Chile. And I just want to tell you in advance that the speech is not directed at you, that Congress is basically, you know, needs to be mollified, and that I am sympathetic with what you are trying to do here. And you'll see that he says... He says right in the middle, the speech is not aimed at you. My evaluation is that you are a victim of all left-wing groups around the world and that your greatest sin was that you overthrew a government that was going communist. And then he says, but you know, Congress, we've got to deal deal with them, so we're going to have to uh, address this issue. Later in the meeting, Pinochet says, you know, I'm an anti-communist. I got rid of all the communists here. You guys have a funny way of of treating your friends. You know, you're putting pressure on me for human rights. Congress is trying to pass laws to restrict aid. You know, what what is it with the United States, Pinochet says. And in his memoirs, Kissinger wrote about this, this meeting. He said that he pushed for human rights and pushed Pinochet to return to democracy. And at the point where... Pinochet says, you have a funny way of treating your friends. Kissinger in his memoir says, I return to my theme about human rights and democracy. Well, in the transcript of the meeting, the first thing that Kissinger says is, there is a lot correct in what you say. It is a very strange time in the United States with the whole Vietnam War. We're going to have to wait to see what the new election between Ford and Jimmy Carter produces. So essentially, he commiserates with Pinochet and accepts his arguments about how screwed up uh, the U.S. Congress is and the, and the kind of the positions on, on human rights that Congress is, is, is forcing. And it does not return to his theme of human rights or democracy. At the very end of the meeting, he says, you know, we want to help you, not hurt you. Uh, I am sympathetic with what you are trying to do here. That was the message that Pinochet got out of the meeting, it's very interesting to note that during the meeting, Pinochet raised the issue of Orlando Letelier, his most vocal critic, who was living in Washington, saying that, you know, that Letelier was telling lies about Chile's human rights record. Kissinger does not respond. He does not say, from my briefing papers, what Letelier is saying about your human rights record is correct. He simply avoids the issue altogether. Later in the meeting, Pinochet brings the name up again. By the time the meeting's over, he's brought the name Letelier up twice and gotten really no, no real response whatsoever, no defense, no nothing. Within a few weeks of that meeting, Pinochet and the head of his secret police, Manuel Contreras, set in motion the mission to send a team of agents to Washington to plant a bomb uh, under Letelier's car. Uh, he and his two colleagues, uh, his research assistant, Michael Moffat, and Michael Moffat's wife, Ronnie Moffat, a 25-year-old, were driving down Massachusetts Avenue uh, on the morning of uh, September 21st, and they, unbeknownst to them, there was a car following their car uh, with two uh, anti-Castro Cubans uh, in it who were collaborating with the Chilean secret police. And as the car entered a very famous area called Sheridan Circle, on Massachusetts Avenue, 
right in front of the Turkish embassy, the uh, these two uh, guys in the car behind them uh, pressed a, a button on a on a on a pager that had been modified to to detonate this this bomb. The bomb went off, and Orlando Letelier were, was killed, and Ronnie Moffat um, died an hour or so later uh, as well. Until Osama bin Laden flew his hijacked planes uh, into the Pentagon on, on September 11, 2001, the Letelier Moffat car bombing was considered the most significant act of international terrorism ever taken place uh, in Washington, D.C. Pinochet is being prosecuted now in Chile for crimes that were similar to the Letelier Moffat assassination a similar car bomb that was used to kill uh, one of his uh, critics uh, from his own military who was living in Buenos Aires in September of 74, and 10 other murders that took place under something called Operation Condor, which was a collaborative effort between the Chilean secret police and the secret police forces of the Southern Cone to track down their, their, their critics and their enemies, kidnap them, torture them, disappear them, kill them. And... When I talk about the prosecutions against Pinochet, again, somebody will say, hey, what about Henry Kissinger? And in fact, there were two legal suits filed against Henry Kissinger. But let me just turn to the legal cases, and I'll finish with this. The first case that was filed came from the family of that Chilean general that I talked to you about, General Rene Schneider, who was killed in October of 1970. And I personally carried some of the declassified documents on this case down to Chile in, in December of 2000. I met with uh, Rene Schneider's grown-up son, whose, whose name is Rene Jr., and I gave him these documents. And the family, he, he and his brother and his mother, did decide to file a civil suit for wrongful death against Henry Kissinger uh, and uh, the former director of the CIA, Richard Helms, for this covert operation that led to the death of, of General Schneider. A second suit was filed about six or seven months later by a group of, of, of family members of human rights victims who were killed after the coup. And they charged that Kissinger had supported Pinochet's human rights violations and therefore should be held accountable uh, for uh, the atrocities that took place. And if the only way to do it was through a civil suit, then they were going to file a civil suit in Washington. Those are the two cases. Of the two of them, the Schneider case was always the strongest one because the paper trail on Operation F.U. Belt led to Kissinger's office. And let me just show you, for example, the CIA cable that was sent only an hour after high CIA officials met with Kissinger on October 15, 1970. You'll see a reference to that meeting in the very first sentence, that policy objectives and actions were reviewed at high U.S. government level. That's a reference to the meeting with Kissinger. And that the guidance out of this meeting, the operational guide, was that it was firm and continuing policy that the Allende be overthrown by a coup as soon as possible. And we are going to continue to generate maximum pressure towards this end, utilizing every appropriate resource. But we had to do this secretly so that the U.S. hand didn't show. Now, it's very, very difficult to, to sue a, a former U.S. Uh, uh, official. And this case has been in court for four years. And it was actually dismissed by the judge after four years of back and forths on the grounds that the plaintiffs were charging wrongful death and the court really didn't have the power to decide whether, in foreign policy terms, General Schneider's death was wrongful or not. And they said that Kissinger had limited sovereign immunity. For those of you studying to be law students, going to go into international human rights, limited sovereign immunity is actually the same ruling that Pinochet got in London, the first ruling that he got when he was first arrested there. And the first court said, well, he really can't be arrested and extradited because he has sovereign immunity. He was a former official and and therefore he, uh, he has immunity. And basically the U.S. courts and the U.S. laws also hold that a U.S. official acting in official capacity has immunity. And the 
lawyers in this case have been unable to convince the court that Kissinger would have done this either outside of his official obligations as a national security advisor or, and this was the argument that was used successfully in London against Pinochet, that ordering the kidnapping of a commander-in-chief that results in his murder in a foreign country is not legitimately recognized as an official duty of a U.S. official in any international court or any domestic court. And that second argument is the one that the lawyers in this case are trying to focus on the most. It was used successfully in London to convince the courts there that Pinochet could not have immunity for acts of torture, for acts of murder, for acts of international terrorism, because no government recognizes those types of atrocities as legitimate acts of government. And in fact, Chile, starting in 1988, had signed international treaties on these types of atrocities, pledging not to commit them and condemning them in any country around the world, which put it on record as not recognizing those as legitimate acts of government either. Kissinger has had his problems traveling. He is the single U.S. official traveling abroad who has run into to, to, to real issues. He was in France two years ago, and a local uh, magistrate there petitioned the court to be allowed to present Kissinger with a set of questions, and they gained permission from the court, and the lawyers went to his hotel to present him with basically demand that he be given a deposition, and Kissinger refused to accept this and immediately went to the airport and left the country. A year later, he was due to go to Brazil and receive a very prominent presidential award, and word got out that he was coming And a number of human rights groups went to the courts and said that if Kissinger came to Brazil, he should be deposed. He should have to declare, testify under oath, give a deposition on what he knew when he was Secretary of State about human rights abuses from Chile, about Operation Condor, this international network of of secret police officers uh, operating in the Southern Cone and around the world, committing acts of terrorism, assassinating people. And Kissinger simply decided not to come. He canceled his his visit to Brazil. And I've talked to at least two people that that, that know people in his office who say that wherever he travels now, an advanced team uh, reviews the legal system of the country he's going to to see if there's any possibility that there'll be a lawyer or a judge that wants to question him. And as I said in the beginning, this is one of the ways that Chile continues to haunt him virtually wherever he goes, wherever he's invited, uh, that he has to uh, consider these things. In the end, we may not have, and I don't think we will have, a courtroom verdict, but we do have a verdict of history on, on Henry Kissinger's role in Chile, and that is, I think, extremely important. You're interested in it. I'm interested in it. And there'll be many students in the future that are, that are interested in it as well. And the documents are there for you to read, for you to evaluate this uh, really extraordinary era of U.S. foreign policy, which remains so relevant today. So I thank you for coming. That was Peter Kornbluh on Kissinger and the coup in Chile. He spoke at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. Since his presentation, the civil suit brought against Henry Kissinger by the family of General René Schneider was dismissed. And in December 2006, General Augusto Pinochet died. Henry Kissinger continues his career as an honored media guest, and he advises Bush and Cheney on Iraq policy. Peter Kornbluh is senior analyst at the National Security Archive in Washington, D.C. He's the author of Bay of Pigs Declassified and The Pinochet File. This program is produced by AR, an unembedded award-winning weekly series based in Boulder, Colorado. AR is independent. Our sole source of financial support comes directly from listeners just like you. AR features such voices as Laura Flanders, Bill Moyers, Angela Davis, Tarek Ali, Howard Zinn, Amy Goodman, and Noam Chomsky. 
to access our vast audio catalog and to find out about subscribing to AR so you don't miss a single program, go to our website, alternativeradio.org. Again, our website, alternativeradio.org. To place a credit card order for a CD, MP3, or written transcript of the program you just heard, Peter Cornblue on Kissinger and the Coup in Chile, call us toll-free at 1-800-444-1977. Again, that toll-free number is 1-800-444-1977. Or you can order on our secure website, alternativeradio.org. That's alternativeradio.org. Ed Russell of Active Ingredients Media recorded the program. Ali Lightfoot is our editor. Series theme music is performed by the Kronos Quartet from Pieces of Africa. I'm David Barsamian. Thank you for listening.